Hey, I'm super pumped for a special episode of Three Questions with my friend DJ Reamer. Got the soundboard. I'm like, I pumped. We just had like the longest talk and it's always awesome. And I actually got my special because I know you're a Packers fan. So I got my special. The Bears. The Bears. <laughs> so I just had to play that for you. Um, Deidre, I'm like really pumped to um, not only have you do the three questions podcast with me, but also you are actually one of the collaborators of the book that's coming out that's based on the three questions podcast called Because of a Teacher. And uh, the the title, working title is Stories of the Past to Inspire the Future of Education. And you wrote a wonderful story. So Deidre, I know people have seen you before. You're like a favorite guest on, you are, a, people love you right? Thank you. Well, they do like you're doing some really incredible work and like all the people in West Alice, like uh, shout out. Where's uh, I got to do a shout out to West Alice. Like uh, where's my shout out button? I don't, Oh, I'll do this one. I'll do the macho man instead. Oh yeah. West Alice. <laughs> you know, macho man, right? I know you're into wrestling. Yeah. I got to meet him years ago. Okay. So DJ's actually, um, I usually do be, uh, who's a teacher that inspired you, who's an administrator that inspired you. And then what advice would you give yourself uh, as a first year teacher? But I'm going to switch the order a little bit because we're going to save uh, your story because you actually wrote a really great story about a teacher that inspired you. So let's start off with the administrator. And I know um, in your work with West Alice, you have incredible administrators and uh your superintendent's awesome met so many great people from there so when you think about like an administrator who is someone that really inspired you and why it could be someone you're working with or someone you experienced as a kid uh yeah i thought about this question a ton because you're right i do work <laughs> with some unbelievably amazing administrators in the work i get to do every day with our 18 school sites and um as i thought about like what is it that really makes that person stand out to me so many of our administrators are really learner centered mm -hmm. and they're really focused on kids having the best opportunity possible on their watch and letting students take the lead on a bunch of the work that they need to do um, but when i thought about one in particular it really wasn't somebody that i'm working with right now it was somebody who used to work in west dallas who retired a few years ago that was kind of my grounding person in the world of curriculum and instruction. So I have been, uh, I was a special ed teacher for most of my career and frequently in the world of special ed, we used to get a little left off of the mm -hmm. curriculum and instruction type work because you were doing something so different and special ed never should be in place of it always right. should be in addition to. And so I worked with an administrator and I always pushed back on that as a teacher. It was not, I was not always the most popular friend all the time because I was like, oh, time out. <laughs> let's talk about where these kids, I know they have behavior issues, but let's talk about where they actually have a place in the classroom and um, what we can do together to scaffold the skills so that mm -hmm. all the learners can be successful in this class. And so she was the first administrator that really said, well, time out. If you are working with the kids with special needs, I need you to be the better instructor than anyone else in this building. Um, and her name is Deb Beyer, and she mm -hmm. was with us for many years. She was my instructional principal when I first came to West Dallas. So we had a school principal and then an instructional principal that shared the two intermediate schools. Mm. And I was the self-contained EBD teacher. So I had the kids that really were challenging when it came to their behavior. And then I had the kids who couldn't read and were challenging with their behavior. And so I said, well, time out. If I'm suddenly a reading teacher, somebody's going to have to, I didn't really know a ton about foundational reading skills at that time and all those things. And she said, that's what you want to do. You want to make sure everybody can read. And I said, well, yeah, because if they're going to get out of right. this classroom, they have to be able to read and they have to be able to read really well. And she just dove right in. And then she did so much work when she was in West Dallas around teacher leadership. So she would recognize teachers that really had a powerful voice when it came to everything that was right in classrooms for kids and knew how to create communities of learners that were achieving at super high levels. And so she had a, a teacher leadership team that she would invite people to be on. And she would push you really hard. Like you are now standing up and you're a leader in that school. You need to go back to that school that you've come from, to gather all the schools in our area. And you need to go back and be the leader that we trusted you to be. So I learned so much from her as far as just standards-based instruction and creating those high levels of expectations mm -hmm. 
all over the place. And then a lot around being a teacher leader. Like, what did it mean that I could work with a colleague and push them? And I'd co-taught with a lot of regular ed teachers in the teaching situations I was in. And I was always really invested in making sure we were getting at the right levels of content and the right levels of kids with the right innovative practices that keep the kids really engaged. But this kind of took that to a whole new level. Um, and then the other thing is she used to run our professional development sessions as well for the 612s. And so we would go to professional development and it was always a layer on something else we should do. Mm -hmm. So it was never, you didn't come one time and you're talking about this and you came the next time and you right. were talking about this. And it all had just kind of an aligned purpose. And she would be on it every time. Like, hey, we talked about this last time. Right. Now we're talking about this. Let's keep the work going forward. And um, never afraid to confront it if she saw something that she didn't think was in the best interest of the learners we were serving. And so brave in her conversations, just consistent in what she expected from people, and yet fun. Like, mm -hmm. always willing to just take a few minutes and have the real conversation with the staff that she worked with. And that has really inspired me in the work I get to do now. And she was actually retiring. She very complimentary said to me, I'm glad it's you because I really think you're going to be able to do some of these things and carry them forward. And it meant a ton to me in that moment in time that somebody I respected that much was excited to see me in this role. Um, but it helped me really understand the value of professional development that's purposeful and intentional and then mm. layers over and over again. Yeah. And th that, that actually like a lot of the struggle that I see with pr professional learning from many educators is that they feel like it's sometimes just like a time filler, right? Like, Hey, we're, we're going to get somebody here for this day. And so we got something planned for you, but it's actually not necessarily building to something bigger. Right. And I think part of it too, when you're talking, um, I think it helps us kind of go on a path, develop our strengths, see kind of where we fit into that space, which I actually think ties into kind of your philosophy with, you know, students that, you know, kind of being in these spaces, because I like, and I don't know if this is a controversial thing I'm gonna say, I don't actually believe all kids go in a classroom are gonna, like we can get them all to the same place. I don't believe that. Cause I don't think that's, I don't think it's good. I don't, I think you have very, like, think about that. Think about it in the staff, right? So not all staff are great with technology do all of them need to be not all staff are great with this but what we do is we build a team with these contributions and i know you're a big basketball fan and it's it's kind of like the phil jackson philosophy right like the like you got michael jordan but he needed other people to know what their roles were in on that team and they all contributed to the greater good and i think if kids know what their strengths are when they're in that class um they have their own like you know, like I always talk about success being a very personal thing. They have their personal plan for success. And it doesn't mean a kid because they're not good at like high level calculus that they're a failure. But if a kid actually knows what they're really good at when they walk out of class, I think that's an important aspect. I think we learn a lot from each other. And I, I don't know, I don't know if that's something that I'm pretty sure we're along the same path, but you know, I, like I wasn't great at science and I've done okay in my life. And I, but there's a lot of people that are great in science that I, I benefit from too, right? Well, and that's a huge part of our vision is that our job is to empower kids to live life on their own terms. Right. Right. Because your pathway and my pathway don't have to be the same. And mm -hmm. we don't walk into the room naturally with the same strengths. But I need to build a community in that classroom where your strengths are valued. Right. And if it's a struggle to find out what those are, that we do that work. Um, and that we're in a, a community where I can say, yeah, I can rely on you because you as a teammate, as a mm. classmate in this space might be really good at this, but my pathway may be to go off and do this. And maybe I'm a kid who's going on to college and that's great, but maybe I'm not. And that's great too. But what, as long as during that time in school, we're creating that moment to say, what is it? And giving kids multiple opportunities to explore and figure that out. You know, when you look at the national graduation rates from right. college and you look at the number of employers who are saying, I just need people who can stick with something. Right. I need people who can um, communicate and collaborate and work with each other well. Those are those skills that we can build in schools, I think, deeper that actually help a learner say, OK, at 17 or 18, maybe I'm going to be an entrepreneur. 
Mm. And therefore, we should have some coursework in schools that are entrepreneurial, that teach students about how to run a business, how to do those kinds of things. And we've been doing some of that work in West Dallas for a while now. And you're watching learners start to say, oh, right. that could be my pathway. Sweet. Watch me go then watch me take off. And I wouldn't have known that was my pathway if you didn't give me the opportunity to run a coffee cart at a right. school event or to be a student who decided to start a t-shirt business. Now I'm saying, oh, wait, maybe that's more of what I want to do when I leave school. And mm -hmm. so also for teachers, it's the same thing. You know, we all come into a school setting with different strengths and we co-teach in most of our classrooms, whether it's two regular ed teachers, a regular ed teacher and a reading specialist, a regular ed teacher and a social worker, a regular ed teacher and a special ed teacher, whatever the makeup of that um, classroom might be. But we co-teach in most of our settings because it's such a powerful opportunity mm. to have somebody right there in the space with you trying to navigate what's next and how do we kind of divide and conquer to help the students who are still trying to figure out where their place is and what their strengths are and help the ones who already know to run with that and thrive with it. And it doesn't mean everybody's going to end up in the same place. We want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to figure out what their place is going to be. And for some of our learners, it takes a lot more time totally. of giving that opportunity to them for them to figure it out. And for some kids, it's right out of the gate that they know, but involving their families and involving everybody and saying, hey, this is what we're investigating in school. And what would your pathway be next? And how do we as a school community work with the outside community to design that pathway together is what the work that we're doing in West Dallas right now that we're really, really proud of, but all based around solid instructional practice and mm -hmm. kids mastering content at the same time that they're learning how to communicate and collaborate and problem solve and feel their place of oh, the feeling they belong in a space so that they really want to work hard. The, the thing that like, I wrote this down as I'm listening to you and it's like, I think it's really powerful. It's like basically not all people have the same strengths, but all people have strengths. Right. And that's, that's, and I think that a lot of times we want our classrooms, our schools, that all people have the same strengths, but that's actually not what makes this good, right? So I, I love yeah. that. And, and and here's what I know and what I appreciate. All these answers, I've seen evidence of you doing in your schools, which is you know why so many people appreciate you and why I love talking to you. And so the second question, and I think is, um, it's interesting because I've worked with you probably, I think the last two or three years, um, and I have seen things that you have done specifically different as you've grown in that short amount of time. And so I know that you're a constant learner. I know that you constantly evolve in your practice and you're willing to try uh, some, some new and interesting things. But like, let's go back all the way to when you first started teaching, right? So like- It was, like, you, it was like right before I met you, George. Right. Oh, so right. I'm, right. I'm so you've only been teaching. That's amazing. So Very like, well. you are so far ahead of me, but so like, <laughs> let's just say what the, okay. So four years ago, something like that. Yeah, exactly. So when you exactly. first started teaching, right. So like, actually, now that I'm thinking about this, like I'm, I just, the evolution of stuff that I've seen you do in the past couple of years is incredible. And if you evolved at that same rate, you must've been a really bad first year teacher. <laughs> Right? Like it must have been terrible because like you grow so quickly, but when you first started, because <laughs> no, I'm just so kidding, obviously. But like if like seriously, you like I actually like this is one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that you are never nervous to try something new. And but like yeah. and it's a kind of that that idea of oh, like we need like we need people to take risks and people kind of inherently think it's dangerous, but you your risks are very like thought out and it's, it's, it's like, it's always in the, like, you're never like, Oh, like this might like screw up this kid's life for the forever. Like it's not, that's going to happen, but you're like, Hey, this is something we haven't done before. And I can see huge benefits if we can pull this off. So when you go back to, you know, the, the, your early days of teaching, what advice yeah. would you give yourself? And I know that wasn't very long ago, so it should be very fresh in your memory. <laughs> Very complimentary. It yeah. was 1994, so it was a while ago. Um, but 
the, I would say at that time, I think, um, I, again, I was a self-contained EBD teacher. So I had this group of sixth through eighth grade. Right. They were all boys at the time. And we were at the last class at the end of a hallway, right? Because we were not exactly super welcome into the rest of the school community. And my first answer was, somebody tell me why our classroom is here. And this is like my first day of teaching. And the kids were like, oh, did they not tell you what job you signed up for? Mm. We're really naughty. And I thought, well, that's going to make for a really long year then if our goal here is that right. you're naughty and I'm, right. what, what do I do then? Help <laughs> me understand like how this works. And um, the story they told about what they thought they were at school to do, I was like, mm, I think you might have that wrong. <laughs> um, so I said, like, okay, let's be real. We are in a hallway at the very end, like we're in our own right. wing of the school. What does that say about us as a group? Mm. And they were like, we told you we're really naughty. And I said, Ooh, here's what I'll tell you. You guys are crazy smart and you're unskilled. So what's great about that is I'm pretty good at helping kids build skills. And so right out of the gate, I think something that stayed really consistent in my practice, it was my desire to figure out who these individuals are so that we can figure out what they need in order to go be successful at whatever it is they wanted to do. The thing I would challenge my own self on is I did so much of that by myself. Mm -hmm. I was the only teacher at the end of that hallway. There were amazing teachers who worked in that school with me that first year who I just, I was on a mission and I'm doing this kind of all on my own. And I learned a ton about being more collaborative the next year, my program moved to a different school. And so instead of being down a hallway by ourselves, we were the only class held in the basement. Um, so we worked on that quite a bit. And mm -hmm. by the end of the year, our class wasn't in the basement and the kids were in their least restrictive environment and where they should be. And they knew what was expected of them in those classrooms, but they still didn't do that enough by relying on the other people that did make up the strengths mm -hmm. of the whole team. And so that's something I feel like I've learned a ton on how to do is to say, okay, I'm really good at these things, or this is something I could learn really quickly to do on my own, but I need these other people because I am not actually that good at this, and nor do I need to develop all the mm -hmm. expertise, right? There are people around me I can do that with, and I became more and more and more collaborative as my career went on, and I co-taught in different situations, and I taught three-year-olds um, in Hawaii for a year and right mm -hmm. off by the beach, and learned a ton about why school is so much fun. And I had a lot of thoughts on what is the difference between these three and four year olds that I had in an inclusionary classroom there. What happens to kids that by sixth and seventh grade, I was working with some kids who felt so unwelcome or so disconnected because there's something part of that that we do in schools, but it's not my job to solve that all by myself. Um, so that would be my advice to look back and give to myself is be uh, give myself a little bit more grace. Mm -hmm. I was probably working a lot harder, putting in more hours right. into the role than was super realistic. Then, at the then time. you are now, then you are now, because no, I don't think that's possible. Perfect. You know, I, I do tend to be very <laughs> invested in, in, my and in, my and in my family. Um, but no, but I would say that. <laughs> I was spending that time just thinking it was all on me. And that is something that wasn't necessarily realistic. And so to get like narrow focused and then be more collaborative mm -hmm. with the people around me, like, that is something I would tell myself at that time. What, what's interesting when you set this in it, like I, I kind of know this, but it's it just kind of connecting it to your story is when you talk about those students and you said like, hey, like, you know, we're developing your skills but you, you know, you're, you have intelligence already. And when you look at your career, I know at any point you would have been a great teacher, even if no offense, if you didn't have the skills that you do now, right? Because that, that's something, if you, if you don't, I know you've always cared about, you've cared about kids. And I think the skills can always be developed, but if you, have the skills, but you don't care about kids, then we're gonna have an issue. Like that's gonna be part of the problem. So like, I think that even, and I say this in the book, um, is that when, when you look at, even when you were probably at your weakest as a teacher, if you cared about kids, you're still probably making like those kids, you, I'm sure you'd say like, hey, here's the things I know better with now than when I first started teaching you, but they would all see that you made a significant difference 
uh, in their lives, which I think is really amazing, which goes on to the, 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 the last question, which is typically first, but it, it was just such a, an awesome answer. And, uh, everyone knows I'm into basketball. So like, I know there's a basketball connection here too. And there's a really personal story for you. Um, but when you think of that first year teacher or the teacher that really inspired you, you have a very special answer. So just share who that is and, and why. Yeah. Um, that was a no brainer for me when yeah. you asked me that question originally, and it's my dad. Um, and my dad was, um, a coach and a teacher for all of his life and grew up, his dad passed away when he was really, really young. Mm -hmm. And so my grandma didn't know exactly what to do with him. So she sent him to Ray Myers basketball camp for his whole summer. So he'd leave at the soon as school was out and he'd stay with Ray all summer in Eagle river, Wisconsin at his boys basketball camp. And Ray Meyer was the coach of the DePaul Blue Demons for years and years and years, the basketball coach and just this amazing human being that became like a second father to my dad. And mm -hmm. he helped my dad. My dad ended up going to DePaul on a track scholarship. And then he helped my dad get his first teaching job, which is actually at the school where my mom and all my aunts and uncles went to school is where my dad started his teaching career. Um, it's actually how my my mom and dad met mm -hmm. um was through this school and through the school community and so um and the whole time i was growing up then we had moved out to the suburbs and he was teaching at a local catholic high school and so i spent most of my growing up in his gym or in his classroom and when i wasn't in school that's where i was and on the weekends we were in the gym and he was the basketball coach and he was um, that tennis coach for a while, although I didn't when, I didn't know that until I showed up at school one day and he's like, we have to go to tennis practice. I'm like, do we even know how to play tennis? And he's like, yeah, I'm the tennis coach. I'm like, okay, well, this would be interesting. Um, but the thing about that time that it was this feeling that you could see and feel around him all the time, this how much he cared for the human beings mm -hmm. that he was in front of every day and he was not afraid to push people and he was not afraid to be honest with how they were doing in their skills on the court. How were they doing in the skills in the classroom? But his classroom was this place full of amazing, amazing stories mm -hmm. all the time that always had that thing you needed to hear right when he was telling it. Um, and it was amazing to watch him interact with high school kids. And then they were all our babysitters. And so our house always had, you know, um, his students or his players hanging out at the house. And we were all at their tournaments all over the place growing up and um, listening to the way he would choose to interact was you just knew something magical was happening. And I was little and I didn't totally get exactly what that was. I just thought that's how all right. the teachers would be. And then I went to a school where the, a lot of the teachers were um, very connected to the families as well. So for me, I'm like, oh, okay, that just is kind of what it is. And then as we got older, he started working in the restaurant business. And so I started working with him in the restaurant business. And my sister, who is two years younger than I am, but five inches taller than I am, um, and naturally gifted athlete, my older brother, naturally gifted athlete, my little brother, who's 11 years younger than my sister. So there's quite a gap before he was born naturally gifted athletes and mm. i love to play sports and i've coached sports and i'm very involved in sports but i was not competitive the way they were mm -hmm. so my dad started to say oh time out you're not gonna like it when your little sister say that in quotes because again i <laughs> go up to about her armpit um when your little sister is coming up into this high school and playing sports ahead of you mm -hmm. and i was like well i really wouldn't care but yes that would be a thing for people and so he said, and you just don't have the passion for this. I can tell this isn't your thing. So we got to figure out what your thing is. And at that time he knew I was pretty shy, which people would find very surprising mm -hmm. right now. Um, but I actually didn't do well in public speaking in college. I had to drop the course because I got so nervous when I oh, had to wow. talk. That, yeah. So, um, but at the time he knew that I was pretty shy, but I was super organized and I liked to be around people and do those sorts of things. So he started taking me to the restaurant with him when I was really young, when I was about 13, 14, because that's when we kind of first realized my sister, although she's brilliant and has a ton of talents, like what she does when you put a ball in her hands, pretty magical. Right. So we started to realize like, oh, I got to find a different thing for Deidre and I need something to do with her because he coached my brother and he coached my sister and that was his thing he did with them. So he started taking me to the restaurant with him and I would check coats and we would stand there and talk to each other all night. And, 
you know, it seems like a really strange job for a young child at the time, but it really wasn't about that. I didn't learn anything about mm -hmm. hanging up people's coats and whatever, but I spent this time with my dad and I watched him and the way he interacted with people in the restaurant and people, the way he interacted with the people that he met. And it was the exact same way he interacted with people in schools. Mm -hmm. What's your experience like? Tell me why you're here. How can I make what's happening for you today the best experience it can be? And you just watched people kind of light up around that. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, my dad died very, very young. He was 52. Um, and my little brother was seven when my dad passed away. And the when we were at his wake, I would say 80% of his former players and um, players for sure, and yeah. some of his students showed up at his wake mm -hmm. and said things to us like, I am the man I am today because of the investment your dad made in me. I would like to help your family for, you know, they all wanted to help pay for my brother to go to college and things like that, because they wanted to be able to kind of live forward and the legacy that he left for them. And so that's a bunch of, I think, where I get that from right. with just learning who people are and that it's okay that you are different than other people. I have really different strengths than my brothers and my sister, and they have other strengths besides just sports right. that we, some things we hold in common and some things that are different, but he had this way to just be like, Oh, I think I know what you need next and then help you figure it out. And he never did any of it for me. He was like, well, I'll get you in the door, but once you're right. there, it's on you and you've got to figure it out. And if you're not good at this job and you get fired, I'm not going to, like step in, like that's on you, but here's what it could be. And here's what you could expect to do for yourself. And so this idea that he was always putting us in charge of our own pathway. If you want to do this, you're going to have to work hard. If you want to do this, you're going to have to do these things. And at the same time, he had this unbelievably creative spirit to him where he would be like, Hey, what do you think? What if we tried this? How about if we did this? How about if we did this? And some of the ideas were so out there that right. you were like, okay, that is never going to work, but he always figured it out. Right. Always, always figured it out. And so we just had this, it was the inspiration that I think he gives to people just by making sure that they know that he cares. And um, I went back after I'd finished writing that chapter and sent it to you. Ironically, the same day somebody posted something on Facebook, mm -hmm. which was a picture of him coaching a basketball team in 1969. And people started making comments on this Facebook post that he had coached when they were in eighth grade, which is 52 wow. years ago, right? And they were saying about the stories about him showing up at their house when they got sick or being there when the parent passed away or how he just was always there and knew who you were and showed up for you. And I think it's just something I've always carried forward in my life um, forever is how do you show up for people and mm -hmm. how do you give what you can, right? And then be able to hold your own self accountable for doing that really, really, really well. You know, like, so as I'm listening to you, really thinking about, um, first of all, how your dad found gifts, right? And people, not like forced gifts, but found gifts. Those are two very different things, right? Uh, and how he'd find those gifts and then bring out the best. And that, like, he would be so amazingly proud of you because this is what you do all the time. And, and when you think about that, that is one of the greatest legacies you can have as a human being that is a teacher, right? Is that that's what we do. And that's proof right there that even all those years later, being able to do that. Um, I'm going to share something just a little personal with you as I noticed. Um, and it's, I don't know if you have a connection to this, but just listening to you talk about your dad, I like, it's, as you know, like, you, you know, uh, you and I are very close and you know how much, uh, I miss my dad too. And one of the reasons that I really appreciate hearing your story is because I could feel that even, you know, that he's gone, you telling the story, you feel a closeness while you're telling it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, that's what, like, it's one of the reasons I always talk about my dad is that it makes me close to him, even though he's not here. So I appreciate it. Um, I know he'd be so amazingly proud of you and, Thank uh, you. yeah, I just, I'm so I'm excited and, um, I'm starting to tear up and as, as I was when I was reading your chapter as well. So, um, I appreciate you being on here, Deidre. So, and, uh, I know the all of West Alice is very lucky to have you and I'm very lucky to work with you. So, um, anyone who's listening, Deidre is like legit the best, make sure you follow her. You can see her, uh, details in the description below. Deidre, thank you for being on three questions and 
Thank you for uh, the two hours of talking before uh, that we did prepping for this 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's always You're a like, pleasure to get it is. that time with you. And yeah. then you get to come back to West Dallas again on Tuesday. Yeah. That has been a it. big part of our work is not to have any one and done kind of moments, but to bring people back to help us continue right. to evolve. In the as long as they, as long forward. as they don't blow it when they're first there. Right. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> good thing you did okay I just, yeah, when you first good, good, good thing I gave you. you're like I see potential in that guy and we'll just see if you can pick it up a little bit DJ thank you so much for being on and everyone thanks for listening thank you. have a great day everybody <laughs>